We're going to go to the doctor's opinion. And we're going to go to the, the bottom of Roman numeral 25, which is XXV. If you have a fourth edition big book, it will be Roman numeral 27, which will be XXVII. If it's a third edition big book, it will be in Roman numeral 25, which is XXV. So we're on page Roman numeral 25, last line of the page. And here Dr. Silkworth says, of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. Physical. So you see, craving is not mental, it is physical. What happens between my ears is called mental obsession. I find it interesting that the big book authors have done an excellent job of segmenting the physical aspect of my alcoholism and the mental aspect, which is mental obsession. In other words, they spend pages 1 to 23 on the physical condition of alcoholism and page 23 to 43 on mental obsession. Now, if you jump over here to Roman numeral 27, which would be Roman numeral 29 in the fourth edition, third line from the bottom of the page. So I'm on Roman numeral XXVII. Dr. Silkworth says, they took a drink a day or so prior to, that, to the date. Now, notice what he's saying. He's not saying the person had a craving and drank. He said they took a drink and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests. So, in other words, in these two short lines, Dr. Silkworth is letting us know what craving is. It's physical. It's not mental. It's impossible for me to experience craving unless I put alcohol in my body. So, let's go back to the page we were on before, which is Roman numeral 26, XXVI. Fourth edition would be 28, paragraph 1. He says, we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. Well, I need to know what an allergy is. He's, he's, he's saying that the alcoholic has an abnormal reaction to alcohol. That's what allergy means. I looked it up in the dictionary. It means abnormal reaction. So, what I'm going to be doing in the next four weeks in these sessions is I'm not going to assume that you are an alcoholic. That would be arrogant of me to do so. I'm going to give you the dignity of discovering the truth about your own experience. Notice I didn't say I'm going to give you the dignity of discovering your truth. Because if your truth is anything like mine, it's pretty distorted. <laughs> So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be given the dignity of discovering the truth about our drinking experiences. Let's find out first if we are an alcoholic. Let me explain to you why it's essential that we do that. You see, if I'm clear about my experience with drinking, then I can transmit that. Then I can help another person gain clarity with their experience with their drinking. Now, let's assume that I haven't been given the opportunity of being taken through the book in this manner. And my sponsor just assumes that I'm an alcoholic. He's probably going to assume that because he wasn't given the clarity either. So you can't blame the sponsor. That's why it's absolutely essential that I be clear about my own experience. Because I can't help you gain clarity if I don't have clarity about my own experience. So I found it essential for me to find out what is a craving. This is what my sponsor taught me as a result of going through this book. Okay, so let's look at having a manifestation of an allergy. That's an abnormal reaction. So what he taught me to do was to take the statements in the book and turn them into questions. So I stop and ask myself the question, did I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol? Well, what's abnormal? Have you ever noticed how orgasmic alcoholics are when they find their car. <laughs> I found my car. <laughs> it was such an orgasmic experience. I was constantly losing my car. 
and then the following day, I would drink again. That does not sound like a normal reaction. Most people who would lose their car, it would scare the daylights out of them, and they would say, oh my goodness, I can't do that again. I've got to stop drinking. I was, I was regularly running my car into parked cars. I would get out and say, who parked that car there? <laughs> and then drink again. That's an abnormal reaction. Or my mother was having a gathering at her house, and I swore I wouldn't drink. I swore I wouldn't drink. And I meant it at the time. I swear I'm not going to drink. I swear I'll, I'll be a good boy. I'm not going to cause any trouble. No, the police are not going to be coming to the house again. And I would get there and I would drink again. And what would I do the following day? I would drink again. That's an abnormal reaction. So stop and ask yourself, did you have an abnormal reaction to alcohol? Then he goes on to say that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class. What class? The person who has an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And never occurs in the average temperate drinker. So what's a craving? It's a longing for. I remember the first time I was asked, did you experience craving for alcohol when you drank alcohol? No, I just wanted more. Well, that's exactly what a craving is. I would put alcohol in my body, and I would want more alcohol. Now, through the years, I've sponsored guys who would respond to that question in this manner. Did you have a craving when you drank alcohol? Oh, sure, I would drink, and then I craved cocaine. See, I need to be real clear about something. This book was written for alcohol. It was not written for other drugs. Now, if it applies to your situation, then that's wonderful. But keep in mind that it was written for alcohol. So when Dr. Silkworth is talking about the phenomenon of a craving occurring after we put alcohol in our body, he's talking about alcohol. Did you crave alcohol when you put alcohol in your body? And what's really important in this statement, he says, and never Never means not one time. Occurs in the average temperate drinker. In one sentence, Dr. Silkworth tells me how to determine if I'm an alcoholic. It has nothing to do with the drama of my drinking. It has nothing to do with how many cars I wrecked, how many times I was married, how many divorces I had, how many times I filed bankruptcy. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what was my inner experience? You see, when Bill Wilson carried the message of hope to Dr. Bob, that's what he talked about. He didn't talk about the drama of his drinking. You know what he talked about? He talked about his inner experience. He talked about the phenomenon of craving, putting alcohol in his body and wanting more. Being in a situation where he had just dried up because they didn't have treatment centers at, at that time. They had drying out hospitals where he would go in and detox. And he would get out and he was so glad that he was sober. But the thing he wanted more than anything else was another drink. He talked about the remorse, the guilt, the shame, the regret, the hopelessness. Being full of fear, full of anxiety. Not having any purpose or meaning for life. The futility of his existence. That's what he talked about. So, you see, discovering whether or not I'm an alcoholic has nothing to do with the drama. As a matter of fact, I recall going to meetings in that 12-year period and hearing a lot of drama in meetings and not being able to relate. So, let's say I'm brand new. I'm sitting in the back of the room. And this guy's going on and on about all the drama. He talks about being in prison. He talks about... Having three divorces, he wrecked six cars and filed, filed bankruptcy. So I'm a, I'm a newcomer back there, and this is what I'm hearing. Let's see. I've never been to prison. I've never been married. I've never wrecked a car. I've never filed bankruptcy. Maybe I'm really not an alcoholic. And he walks out the door, and we've just lost him. I find that drama creates a lot of distance. It does not create relatedness. That's the stuff we talk about over coffee, to amuse each other. But that's not what I do in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm there to carry a vision of hope and to share my inner experience. So keep that in mind as you're going through these steps. 
So let's turn that into a question. Did you experience a craving for alcohol when you put alcohol in your body? Now, notice he says, and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. So let's say, out of ten times that I drink, I do not experience craving eight times. Am I an alcoholic? According to Dr. Silkworth, I am. You know why? Because he said it never. He doesn't say rarely. He doesn't say seldom. He says, never occurs in the average temperate drinker. You see what separates me from the non-alcoholic? has nothing to do with how many times I've been to jail. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with one thing and only one thing. It's called the phenomenon of craving. I've had the opportunity of going out for business dinners with colleagues who drink. And sitting there and watching them drink, and they'll have one or two. By the time they get the second drink, they push it away, and they say something like, I better stop. I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> well, let's go then. Come on. Let's get it on. <laughs> I cannot relate to that. I've been asked that question multiple times through the years by, by colleagues. They say, well, I don't understand it. What separates you from me? I don't have to go into this big old diatribe about, you know, what I experienced in the 12 years and so on and so forth. And I found a sponsor who had big books of writing, blah, 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 blah. I don't have to go into that. I tell them what phenomenal craving. What do you mean? I put alcohol in my body. I crave more alcohol. And I can't stop. That's how I know that I'm an alcoholic. Okay. The bottom of that page, second line from the bottom. Same page, second line at the bottom, where Dr. Silkworth states, they are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Sounds like he's talking about drinking, doesn't it? Yes and no. Now check this out. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless what? Unless I can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. In other words, I was irritable, restless, and discontented unless I could have that experience again. What's ironic about that is I had the same identical experience in sobriety. Check it out. I am restless, irritable, and discontented unless I can again. I'm reading it in the first person. Unless I can again experience the sense of of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. In other words, I have to find something in sobriety to give me the same sense of ease and comfort that alcohol gave me. And if I do not, I'm going to end up restless, irritable, and discontented. You see, that's what's happened for me as a result of going through these steps. They give me the same sense of ease and comfort. I was one of those people that I would get me a stash because I was so afraid I was going to run out. And it didn't matter that they just turned off the electricity. It didn't matter that she just said, go away. It didn't matter that they just said, we don't want you around. I would get that booze, I would get that stash, and I could sit back and go, oh, sigh relief. Everything is going to be okay now. I have that same identical experience in sobriety. So, see, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. I know deep down in my heart of hearts, everything's going to be okay. After they succumb to the desire again, here again, he's telling us about craving. After I succumb to the desire, that means the desire is not a craving. That's what's happening with mental obsession and desire. I think about it. As so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. I can't tell you how many times that happened. This is repeated over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. Do you know what psychic means? It means mind. There needs to be an entire change in the way I think. Now, do I have the power to do that? If I was capable of doing that, what am I doing here with you? After 
20 plus years of sobriety, how come I'm still going to meetings? If I could just pull up my boots by the straps and just say, I'm going to change my thinking. Absolutely. <laughs> I would have already done it. So, let's turn this into a question. Are you willing to consider that unless you experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of your recovery? Are you willing to consider that? Now, on that same page, go to the third paragraph, same page, third paragraph, go down to line three. Line three, paragraph three. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. So here the authors are telling us the entire psychic change must occur, or there's very little hope by recovery, and no human power can make that happen. Can your sponsor produce that psychic change in you? Can your wife, girlfriend, your children, your money, your car, your boat, your house, your belief in God, can that produce a psychic change for you? It tells me here something more than human power. Here I'm being told nothing human can make this happen. Are you willing to believe that? Okay, let's turn to page 11. Page 11, paragraph 4. Before reading this paragraph, I would like to paint a picture for you. Bill Wilson is in his apartment. He's in his kitchen drinking gin. An old friend of his, Ebby T., who later becomes his sponsor, comes to visit him. He shows up on his doorstep sober. And he's got a gleam in his eye. And he looks really different. And Bill hasn't seen this guy sober in years. And he's curious. Now, keep in mind, Bill Wilson is drinking gin. He even offers to have a drink. Nebby says, no, I've got religion. But there's something uniquely different in Abby, and he can't figure out what it is. So he's trying to consider, where did Abby get the power to make this happen? And this is what he says. Had this power originated in him? In other words, did it originate in Abby? Then he realizes, obviously, it had not. So he realized, now keep in mind, he's drinking. He realizes that the power did not originate in Eddie. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute, and this was none at all. This is where Bill Wilson discovers he has no power. That is the very essence of step one. In other words, the authors have spent half of the book on the instructions, 43 pages, to get across one point. No power. See, I thought step one, and I thought Alcoholics Anonymous was about not drinking. Now, don't get me wrong. It's helpful that you don't drink. But what I discovered is that AA is not about not drinking. Step one is not about not drinking. See, if step one was about not drinking, we could do away with all those words, and it would say, quit. Or stop. One thing I am clear about with my alcoholism. I am going to drink no matter what. I am going to drink no matter what. Why? Because I have no power. If I had the power to keep me sober, it would be necessary for me to be in Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, the reason I came into these rooms was not because I wanted to stop drinking. Consider this for a moment. If you are a real alcoholic, why would you want to stop? I didn't. I wanted to stop suffering. But I did not want to stop drinking. Now, if you approached me and said, Paul, I can guarantee that you can drink all you want. And there will be no consequences. How many of you in here would say, let's go? <laughs> Look at all those hands. Yeah. So, 
Maybe it's something we need to consider. Did I really come in here to stop drinking or did I come in here to stop suffering? See, I had this big hole inside of me and I kept trying to fill it up with booze, try to fill it up with women, money, jobs, etc., etc. And I just couldn't fill it up. I wanted to stop suffering. I wanted the pain to stop. I wanted the fear to go away. I wanted the paranoia to disappear. But I wasn't certain I wanted to stop drinking. See, I wasn't convinced that I had no power. The authors have spent all those pages on that one point. We must be really slow. For them to spend 43 pages to get drive home one little point. No power. You have no power. You are going to drink no matter what. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to drink no matter what. Oh boy, now I'm screwed. Now what? What the authors are saying on, in this paragraph on page 11, this is the very essence of step one. It's about no power. Do I have any power when it comes to the phenomenon of craving? Can I control it? Can I control the mental obsession that kicks in, you know, jumps into my head? Now, here's something to consider. If I have no power with mental obsession, if I have no power with the phenomenon of craving, how manageable is my life? It's probably going to be pretty unmanageable. Okay. Let's turn to page 20. Page 20. Page 20, paragraph 5. Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Can you take or leave alcohol? If you can, you're probably a moderate drinker. Okay, next paragraph. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. In other words, it might even kill him. If a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. So here's the hard drinker. They may need to be hospitalized. They may die before their time. It may cause them difficulty. Given sufficient reason, they can stop or moderate. Was sufficient reason enough for you to stop or moderate? I remember the woman I was married to when I got sober. She asked me to stop drinking. She said, you better stop drinking or I'm leaving. I said, bye. I'm not going to give that up. Mm -mm. I need that more than air itself. And I wasn't going to let anybody get in my way, get in the way of my drinking. So, you see, stop and turn that into a question. What's sufficient reason enough to keep you sober? Next paragraph. But what about the real alcoholic? Now, before I go on, have you ever gone to meetings and you hear, hear some guy stand up and say, Hi, my name's John and I'm a real alcoholic. Did you ever hear that? In the early sobriety I heard it, I thought, how arrogant. Of course, we're all alcoholics. What I didn't know was he was talking about what we're about to read. But what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. I knew people that drank more than me. The difference? They're not alcoholic. Sufficient reason was enough for them to stop or moderate. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. See, that's what separates me from the hard drinker. Once I start to drink, I lose all control. Sufficient reason isn't enough. I can't take it or leave it like the moderate drinker. So here we have opportunity to further examine if I'm a real alcoholic. See, if I'm clear about my drinking experience and I discover I'm a real alcoholic, I can help another person gain clarity about their experience. If I don't have that experience, I can't transmit that. Page 23. Page 23, paragraph 1. Page 23, paragraph 1. Line 3. 
Earlier I stated that the authors segment the book and from page 23 to 43 emphasize mental obsession and immediately give us a clue that that's what they're going to do in line three. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind. That's my main problem. It's my thinking. My main problem is not alcohol. Alcohol is but a symptom. Did it cause problems? Of course it did. But my main problem is my thinking. Stop and ask yourself, was your thinking distorted before you got sober? Can anybody in here say no? Okay, now consider this. That's the very same mind you brought with you in here. <laughs> Nothing has changed. <laughs> That's the same mind. We don't remember that, though, do we? We get sober and say, oh, my mind's different now. Now I'm going to meetings, my mind's different. No, it isn't. It's the same mind. But you know what's really wild about that? That's the very same place we go for solutions. <laughs> the very thing that has caused me more difficulty, more pain, and more suffering. I'm talking about insobriety. Forget about drinking. I'm talking about now. Has caused me more suffering, more pain, more humiliation than anything else. It's been my own mind. It hasn't been what has happened to me, but rather my mind's interpretation of what's happening. Okay, let's go to page 24. Page 24, paragraph 1. Page 24, paragraph 1. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Whoa. Turn that into a question. Have you lost the power to choose? This is where resistance comes up. How many times have you heard in meetings, I choose to not drink today? Really? Then what are you doing here? If I could just simply choose to not drink, I wouldn't need to come to AA. I wouldn't be here. I could just simply choose to not drink. Yep, that's I'm just I'm just gonna choose. I'm not gonna drink today. You see, if I had the power to do that, why didn't I exercise it before now? If you're having resistance to that, try to have an open mind. Try to set aside everything you think you know. See, I found it is absolutely essential for me to remain a student in these rooms. When I stop being a student, I stop learning and I stop growing. It's guaranteed. Then the author's going to say, our so-called willpower. It doesn't say our willpower. They have such a great sense of humor, don't they? Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness, that's my mind, with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. In other words, Remembering how bad it was will not keep me sober. This is sounding worse and worse, isn't it? I'm going to drink no matter what. I've got no power. I can't choose whether I'm going to drink. I can't even, even my memory of my suffering, it's not going to keep me sober. I'm an educated person, degreed. I have all this knowledge and information. That's, geez, why even be here? Because it is absolutely an essential part of the surrender for me to acknowledge to my innermost self that I have no power and there's absolutely nothing I can do to keep me sober. Nothing. Because I'm going to drink no matter what. And a little bit of information and memory of suffering is not going to keep me sober. That's what the authors are saying. Check this out. Of even a week or a month ago... So, if that is ineffective when I'm sober one week or one month, what's it going to be like if I'm sober 20 years? My goodness, it's going to be worse. Because the memory has a tendency to fade. That's why it's important for me to continue to work with newcomers. Then they say, we are without defense against the first drink. Are you willing to consider that, that you are without defense? 
Once again, here the authors are trying to drive home that central theme, that I have no power. I'm without any defense. I had it backwards. I thought you were going to teach me how to not drink. What I discovered was it was I had it completely backwards. What I needed to do was I needed to have what is called a first step experience. I needed to admit, to concede, that I have no power over up. Look how it's worded. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. That means I have no power. And as a result of making that admission, conceding to my innermost self, then I was in a position to find a power greater than me. So, see, once I have that surrender, now I have desire to seek a power. Until I have that experience, I have no desire to seek that power. Why? If I haven't surrendered and I haven't conceded, there's absolutely nothing I can do to keep me sober. Why even seek a power? I don't need it. Bye. I'll see you later. I don't need you guys. I don't need to come here. I don't need to keep going through the 12 steps repeatedly. If I had power, which I don't. Okay, let's turn to page 34. Page 34, paragraph 2. Page 34, paragraph 2. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We're assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Ask yourself that question. Can you stop on a non-spiritual basis? In other words, on your own power. Can you? Then you may be experiencing the same thing that I did. And that the alcoholics in this book that are being described on these pages. So, if I can't quit upon a non-spiritual basis, I've probably lost the power to choose whether I will or will not drink. Consider this. You run into me at a meeting, and you hear me saying, I choose to not drink today. When I say that, who am I saying has the power to keep me sober? Me. Who am I saying deserves all the credit? Me. So if I'm saying that, why am I here? You want to find out if a person's taken the first step as outlined in the big book? You only need to ask one question. Only one. Can you choose to not drink today? Stop and ask yourself that question. Can you just simply choose? See, the moment I begin thinking that I can choose to not drink, I've instantly deluded myself. Because I've convinced myself I have the power. And that I'm going to deserve all the credit. Now, back here on page 25. Third paragraph. Page 25, paragraph 3. If you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could, and the other to accept spiritual help. So here the authors are telling me that there's only two alternatives. Either keep drinking, keep living the way I am, or seek spiritual help. There's no middle-of-the-road solution. There's a way that you can explore that within yourself by asking yourself this question. What would happen to Alcoholics Anonymous if every single member was doing sobriety the way I'm doing it today? What would happen if Everybody was doing it the way I'm doing it. Is it middle of the road solution? 
Is that what you're seeking? Because if that's what you're seeking, that's what you'll receive. So let's look at the unmanageability in our lives. What do you think? What is the most insane thing you've ever done? The most insane thing I have ever done, I've done in sobriety. The most insane thing. And I'll tell you what it was. It was a direct result of my mind. I'm sober. I've already gone through the steps. I'm happy, joyous, and free, man. I'm fat, dumb, and happy. I'm having fun. And one day it crosses my mind. I bet I could have a drink. That's insane. That is the most insane thing I've ever done. Thinking, after having a spiritual awakening, after being free from the compulsion to drink, one day my mind tells me, I think I could have a drink today. Does that sound crazy? Now, if you doubt that, turn to page 52. Here's a great description of unmanageability. Page 52, paragraph 2. Page 52, paragraph 2, line 3. Let's turn these statements into questions. We were having trouble with personal relationships. Are you having trouble with personal relationships? We couldn't control our emotional natures. Can you control your feelings? We were prey to misery and depression. Are you subject to that? We couldn't make a living. This has nothing to do with making money. They said make a living. This is about living. This isn't about earning. You having trouble making a living? We had a feeling of uselessness. Do you feel useless? We were full of fear. Are you full of fear? We were unhappy. Are you unhappy? Does it seem that you couldn't be of real help to other people? So you see, mental obsession is not confined to sitting around saying, I'm going to drink, I'm going to drink, I'm going to, oh, I've got to have a drink, I've got to have a drink. It has many different forms in the book. Switching. Only waiting until 5 o'clock to drink. Here's another one. I've been sober a long time. My life's manageable now. I can drink now. That's called mental obsession. So if I'm truly, if I truly have no power over mental obsession, I truly have no power over the phenomenal craving once I put the alcohol in my body, how can I possibly have a manageable life? So see, basically, step one tells me this. I have no power and I need a new manager. That's basically what it's saying. Page 39. Page 39. Paragraph 1, line 5. Page 39, paragraph 1, line 5. But the actual or potential alcoholic, with hardly an exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. So stop and ask yourself, can I stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to find out who's an alcoholic. If you truly believe that you have no power over mental obsession over the phenomenon of craving, and that your life is unmanageable. Let's turn to page 30. Page 30, paragraph 2. Page 30, paragraph 2. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. You notice that the authors aren't saying that we have to fully concede to our sponsor or the group. You will have an opportunity to examine that in a moment. In addition to that, this is what I would encourage you to do. This is the same thing my sponsor had me do. Go home and sit with me, myself, and my soul and ask myself this question. Am I willing to concede to my innermost self that I have no power and that I need a new manager? Basically, if I say, if I say yes, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying yes, I had an abnormal reaction. Yes, I did experience the phenomenon of craving. No sufficient reason was enough to keep me sober. I lost all control once I started to drink. 
and I have lost the power to choose whether I will or will not drink. So you see, what's most important is conceding to myself. As long as I'm clinging to the idea that I have some power, some knowledge, some information, some memory that's going to keep me sober, there's no room for step two. Look what it says in step two. Came to believe in what? A power greater than myself. So you see, if I'm still clinging to the idea inside of me, I have some power. There's no room for that, is there? And that has been my experience. That's what happened to me in that 12 years I was bouncing in and out of these rooms. I was never willing to concede to my innermost self that I have no power. I was convinced that I had the answer. That I was smarter than everyone else. That I could still choose to not drink. That self-knowledge was the key. I was convinced of it. My behavior, my experiences illustrates that. If I truly believe that I don't have the power, what am I doing testing it? I'm going to drink no matter what. See, I'm faced with that every single morning that I wake up. Well, I'm going to drink today. Today's the day. I'm going to drink. Why? Because I'm going to drink no matter what. That's why I've learned to resort to the spiritual principles, the spiritual practices like prayer, meditation, evening review, working with others, telling other people what's going on with me. So everybody that is here to take the steps, please stand. We are going to consider the questions that I've just reviewed. And we'll go around the room one at a time. After you answer, please be seated. And I'll begin. Am I willing to concede to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic? Yes. Okay. Congratulations. My hope for you is that you had a first step experience. I want to welcome all of you to the Fellowship of the Spirit. And those of you that are on your way to being rocketed into the fourth dimension, congratulations for what you've done today. And thank you.
I want to welcome all of you to the Fellowship of the Spirit. And those of you that are on your way to being rocketed into the fourth dimension, congratulations for what you've done today, and thank you.